Hi there. In this video, we're going to be combining two things we've already talked about. One is rectilinear motion, which is position, velocity, acceleration, motion of a particle along a line. But now we'll be talking it from the point of view of integrals, both definite integrals and indefinite integrals. So we already understand these two ideas. So there's really nothing here that's a new theorem or anything, but it's practice synthesizing these two things we've already talked about. So let's just remind ourselves, we have already learned that velocity is the derivative of position and acceleration is the derivative of velocity. Now that we can talk about antiderivatives, we can reverse that process. So I could say that velocity is an antiderivative of acceleration and position is an antiderivative of velocity. And let's note, I'm using the, the indefinite article an. Any function has infinitely many antiderivatives. So if I'm starting with acceleration, one of its antiderivatives is the velocity function. But we will need to do some work to figure out which one. So let's look at an example. And I'm just going to point out right now, in my original, I typed the wrong number for reasons that will become clear in a second. But you should just double check that Right here, the number that goes there is 32. So I had 16, and there's a reason why I had 16. It's a certain sloppiness. Um, but it should be 32. So just as a fact of physics, Earth's gravity pulls downward with an acceleration of roughly 32 feet per second per second. If you're anywhere near the surface of the Earth, that's basically the, the acceleration of gravity pulling downward. Now, let's assume we have some projectile that has an initial height of four feet and an additional upwards velocity of 12 feet per second. Right, so the idea is here's the ground and we're starting at a height of four and we're originally going up at a rate of 12 feet per second. Well, what's this particle gonna do? It's gonna go up for a while, but gravity will slow it down. It slows down, slows down, and then eventually it'll fall down. So what we want to do is find a formula for position as a function of time. And there's a little typo here. Sometimes I write these in a hurry. This is initial. And I have to confess, I've lost some of my originals and only have the PDF, so it's harder for me to edit this. So starting from this general fact of how much gravity pulls, where our projectile begins and at what velocity our projectile begins, we can deduce the entire formula that describes the motion of this particle. So we'll start with acceleration being negative 32. Right? It's pulling downwards. And we'll think of that as a function. No matter what time we are in this process, this is the value of acceleration. Technically speaking, there would be microscopic fluctuations as we get farther away from the Earth or closer to the Earth. But those fluctuations are so tiny that we can assume this is fine. So that's one little assumption we're making. We're also assuming that we don't have to worry about air resistance. So we're making a few assumptions to simplify this problem. Uh, they won't make a big difference at the scale of this problem. So now, what about velocity? Well, to get velocity, we'll take an antiderivative. So an antiderivative of this acceleration function would be negative 32t. But remember, that's not net the only antiderivative. Any constant could go over this. But we don't know which one. So we're not going to stop here. We don't want to give a general answer. Here, we're just admitting there's something we don't know. That the velocity function for this particular projectile will be negative 32t plus some constant. But here's where we use that additional information. We know that the initial upwards velocity is 12 feet per second. So one way of set expressing that is that the velocity at time zero is equal to 12. But on the other hand, we could plug that into this formula. The velocity at time zero would be negative 32 times zero plus c. And that means that c is equal to 12. So we now know that our velocity function is negative 32t plus 12. That's not our final answer, but it's a very useful piece of information. 
we want to know a formula for position of a function of time. So let's take another antiderivative. If I do that again, my position function would be negative 16 t squared. Right? You think of this as t to the first power. So to do an antiderivative, we bump it up, divide by 2, plus 12t plus c. And this is presumably a different constant, so I would recommend writing something like c2. In practice, sometimes people recycle their c's without comment. I would generally recommend that if it's in the same problem and it's a constant that comes from a different process, give it a different name. So there's a 16 in this formula, which is what I typed, because in my head I was thinking of a different formula and I got sloppy. Again, we need to be a little more specific and figure out, okay, well, what is that constant? We know that our initial position is 4. If we plug that in, plugging in 0 is often really nice. Usually for a lot of functions, if you plug in 0, Either you get 0 as your answer, or you get a lot of zeros there. So always double check, but generally speaking, plugging in 0 is a really nice thing. So we get that c2 is equal to 4, and finally we can say, all right, well, here is my position function. And we could generalize that. For any motion problem like this, and maybe this is a formula you learned in ninth grade physics, I'm not sure. The formula for something moving up and down would have this form, if you're doing it in feet. If you do it in metric, obviously the numbers will be different. But this 16 basically comes from just a fact of gravity. right? We don't get to control how strong gravity is. We don't get to control the mass of the Earth. Those two, those two together, the gravitational constant and the mass of the Earth, dictate this number, and we can't choose it. But we can choose the initial velocity of the object and the initial position of the object. So this is one thing you might do in the realm of rectilinear motion problems. Take antiderivatives to figure out a formula. We can also use definite integrals. So we're going to return to the net change theorem. Remember, the net change theorem is really just a perspective on the fundamental theorem of calculus. And it essentially says the net change in some quantity is the definite interval, the definite integral of the rate of change of that quantity. So as a specific example, if we're looking at position, the rate at which position changes we call velocity. velocity. So if I want to know how much has something changed position, and that's also called displacement or net displacement, I can think, well, the rate at which position changes is called velocity. So taking this definite integral of the rate is the same as figuring out the net change. And now a wrinkle here. Speed is never negative. So let's think about this. Suppose you're moving back and forth and back and forth and back and forth really fast. So your speed is a big number most of the time. But your displacement might, might not be big. If you're just swiveling back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, your change in position is never all that big because you never go that far from where you started. But your total distance traveled just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Total distance traveled, the rate of which that changes is speed. Whether you're going forwards or backwards, your total distance traveled keeps getting bigger and bigger. And if you're going fast, it gets bigger fast. So speed, you can actually think of as the rate at which total distance traveled changes. So if you want to know what is the total distance you've traveled during some time period, you could take the definite integral of speed. And remember, speed is just the absolute value of velocity. And both of these are very easy on a calculator. 
calculator, you can know how to do definite integrals. You can type in absolute value bars. So when you're doing a definite integral and you have your calculator, just type it in. Right? Don't prove to people that you can do it another way. Just get the answer, especially if absolute values are involved. But it is possible to do an absolute value integral by hand, but you have to be tricky. So let's look, well, not tricky, you have to be careful. So let's look at a specific example. Suppose I give you this velocity function, and I want to find the total distance traveled from time 0 to time 10. Total distance traveled would be the definite integral of speed, and speed is the absolute value of velocity. So this is what we want to do. If you are allowed to use your calculator, you're good to go. You have a formula for this. Just type it all in with the absolute values. Your calculator knows what to do. But if we want to do this by hand, we have to be careful. Absolute value is not a differentiable function. So it does not play well with derivatives and integrals. We need to break it up. So I'll just make a little note here. If you need to do calculus, whether it's taking a derivative or an integral with absolute value, generally speaking, you want to break it up based upon where it's positive or negative. So let's do a sign chart for velocity. You'll notice I gave you a velocity function that factors. We're only analyzing this from 0 to 10. Velocity, you can see, would be equal to 0 at 1 and 3. And so if we do a little sign chart for velocity, we'll see it's positive and then negative and then positive. So what that means is that this particle is going forwards for a little bit and then backwards for two seconds and then forwards for the last seven seconds. So this is just a schematic, but it starts here and it ends here. So what we'll notice is because it did a little bit of back and forth, the total distance traveled for this example would be greater than the displacement. It's never smaller, but sometimes they're equal. If you're always going forward, they're equal. If you're always going backwards, they're opposites of each other. But here it's more complicated. So what we're going to do is we're going to break up this integral. Definite integrals can be broken up at the different limits. So I could say that this definite integral I'm trying to do is the same as taking the definite integral on the interval from 0 to 1, which is an interval where I know the velocity is always positive, then add to that the integral from 1 to 3, and then add to that the integral from 3 to 10. Right, what I'm doing here is very tedious. This might be the kind of thing where you just want to watch my computation, and you'll have some opportunity to practice this later. This is something we like to avoid. Again, if you have your calculator, it's way easier. But I do want you to understand that it's possible to do it by hand. So here's the, the thing. When velocity is positive, we don't need those absolute value bars. The abs from, from 0 to 1, the absolute value of velocity is the same as velocity. If something is non-negative, absolute value doesn't do anything. But if something is negative, absolute value is the opposite. So on the interval from 1 to 3, the absolute value of velocity gives me the opposite of velocity. So I'll put in the opposite of my velocity function. This is how you deal with integrals when absolute value is involved.
you take the absolute values out and you just break it up. Oh, for some of these intervals, I am integrating the function. For some of these integrals, I am integrating the opposite of the function. Okay, now my antiderivative here would be 1 third t cubed minus 2t squared plus 3t from 0 to 1. Here it's just the opposite of that. And here we're back to the original. So if I plug in 1, that looks like 1 third minus 2 plus 3. If I plug in 0, that's 0 minus 0 plus 0. You don't have to write this out. If, they were, if you're doing a problem where it's very obvious that plugging in a nice number like 0 or 1 gives you a really obvious answer, don't feel like you have to show every step. Right? Zeros are easy to, to understand. Okay, over here, if I plug in 3, I would have negative 1 third 3 cubed plus 2 times 3 squared minus 3 times 3, which is 9. If I plug in 1, negative 1 third plus 2 minus 3. For this last one, I'm spilling over into a second line. If I plug in 10, 1 third times 1,000 minus 2t squared would be 200, 3t would be 30 minus... Notice how I am putting everything I subtract in parentheses. Use parentheses to make things crystal clear. Don't skip this step. Don't convince yourself that you'll keep track of this. Just write it down with parentheses and distribute in the next step. I promise you, in the long run, that will save you time. Right? You are not saving time if you do it the fast way and then that you're wrong 40% of the time and you have to fix it. Uh, if I plug in 3 here, that's going to be 9 minus 18 plus 9. And I'm just going to leave this, right? If this were an AP free response problem, this would be sufficient. If you want to, you can try to sort through this to clean it up. But from here on out, we're not hiding behind any kind of calculus notation or algebraic stuff. This is pure arithmetic. Anything that's pure arithmetic and clearly correct because we put all our parentheses in the right place would be fine. If your parentheses are wrong, or you are thinking about, oh, I know I'm going to distribute, but you wrote something incorrect, that's problematic on the AP. So make sure everything you write is literally the correct notation. Don't play these games where you know what, where, don't tell me you know what it's supposed to mean, and you would have gotten it right in the next step. Just write something that's true. Okay. So you'll do some practice with this. Again, there's nothing really new in this section. We're just combining things from before. All right. 